Because we study a lot of different types of geometric objects in geometry, we'll have correspondingly a variety of different criteria for what it means for those objects to be congruent. So let's look at some examples. If I have a whole collection of different angles, an angle being determined by where two line segments come together, then which of this set of angles are congruent? How do we determine whether two angles are, quote, the same? Well, looking across this list of five angles shown on the screen, I can find two of them, as sketched, which are congruent in that they have the same angle measure. So the measure in degrees or in radians of these two angles gives us the same number, and so we'll say that those two angles are congruent. There's actually a third angle on here that contains the same pair of lines coming together, but we've measured the other side of the angle. This is one on the end here. So whenever two uh, line segments come together to form an angle, two rays come together to form an angle, they'll make one angle which is less than 180 degrees and another angle that's more than 180 degrees, unless those two lines happen to come together in a parallel fashion, in which case both sides would be 180 degrees. But in this case, we've got one smaller angle which is called the reflex angle, and the other angle which might be called the exterior angle on the other side. So the exterior angle was the one that was measured in the original diagram, and not the reflex angle. And so even though we use the same pair of lines coming together in the same way, if we consider the other side of the angle instead of the reflex, we consider the exterior, then that won't be congruent to the angle in the middle. So it matters which portion of the angle you actually measure uh, when you're measuring for congruence. How about line segments? What does it take for a pair of line segments to be considered, quote, the same or congruent? Here's a collection of line segments. And again, in this collection, I can find two line segments that I want to consider to be the same, the first one and the third one. And the reason I want these line segments to be thought of as the same is that they have the same length. If I were to get out a ruler and measure the length of these line segments, there are only two line segments in this list of five that I would get the same number for when I take that measurement. And so those will be the segments I consider to be congruent. Um, there's not much room for argument there, at least as far as Euclidean geometry goes. Triangles are where it starts to get really interesting. By definition, a triangle is made up of a triplet of line segments coming together and forming three angles. So here's a collection of triangles. And in this list of triangles, which ones are congruent? Which ones of these triangles do I want to consider to be exactly the same as one another from the point of view of geometry? Well, I can find two that to my eye look like they're the same. The second one and the fifth one in this list. The others have some differences in their shapes. They either have some differences in how long some of the line segments are, they might have differences in the measures of some of their angles. In order to be congruent, what we really want is all of those features to be the same for a given pair of triangles. We want them to be made up of the same collection of line segments coming together in the same collection of angles. Now what we'll find out soon is that some of those criteria actually imply the others. In other words, we don't need to know that all three segments and all three angles are congruent to one another. Uh, we can instead say the two triangles are congruent based on a smaller set of criteria. So that's what we'll be looking at next. But for now, we're gonna consider these two triangles to be congruent. As far as other types of geometric figures go, let's think about quadrilaterals for a second. These would be geometric objects made up of four segments coming together in four different angles. Here's an example of a quadrilateral that I can build using two segments with a length of one and two segments with a length of three. This happens to be a quadrilateral called a kite. We don't need to know that yet. But if I just take that same collection of segments, two segments of length one and two segments of length three, I can also make other quadrilaterals with that same collection of segments. Here's an example. We would call this a rectangle because these are coming together at right angles. And I have two pairs of parallel sides of length three and length one. And somehow this is not the same quote unquote quadrilateral as the one on the left. These are not congruent one to another. Likewise, I can rearrange this collection of four segments in another different way that again gives me a figure where all the segments are connected together in the same order as the first figure in the line. Um, but somehow the angles uh, between these segments have now changed. So there are a couple different ways for us to break congruence when it comes to quadrilaterals. Just having the same lengths of the sides is not, the, is not a guarantee of congruence. 
if, for example, the sides don't correspond to one another. We're not connecting them together in the same order as we did. And likewise, even if we do connect them in the same order, a quadrilateral's angles can change depending on how exactly we connect these uh, segments to one another. So somehow there's something about triangles that are going to make them much more natural, uh, much more closed system to kind of study because a smaller collection of information can guarantee for us that two triangles are congruent. And before we move off of this topic, when we think about congruence, we often think about what is the same between a pair of geometric objects, between a pair of angles, between a pair of segments, triangles, and so forth. But for a moment, let's dwell on the question, what might be different in between two congruent figures? It's kind of a silly sounding question at first, but let me just reduce our whiteboard here to just the pairs of congruent angles, congruent segments, congruent triangles. So we are gonna call them congruent, but they look different on the page. They look different to our eye. So what exactly is different about them? Well, we might have taken the angle here at the top and just sort of rearranged it on the page. I've slid it over by a little bit. I've kind of rotated it by a little bit. Um, in the case of the triangle that we see here in the third row, it looks like not only have I rotated it some, but maybe I've reflected it a little bit. I've slid it around, but I haven't really done anything that changes its essential characteristics. The kind of transformation that turns one figure into another figure to which it is congruent describes the, quote, differences between congruent figures. We call those transformations isometries. Iso from the Greek meaning same, metri from the Greek meaning to measure. So isometry connects two figures that have the same measurements, figures that are congruent. And yet it can create a visual difference uh, between these two uh, figures, a, a different place on our page, uh, a different orientation with regards to rotation, and a different orientation with respect to reflection. Um, but that's pretty much it, as we'll see. Isometries therefore tell us how two congruent figures might be different from one another. Later on in our course, we'll have the opportunity to think about isometries in some more detail and sort of pull them apart into what kinds of isometries there are, how they work together with one another, uh, what are their algebraic features. Um, for now, we're not going to worry too much about them, and so-called, we're going to study geometric figures up to isometry. So all of these differences between congruent figures will be washed away for the first portion of our course, and all we're going to care about is figures that are congruent to one another.